Hey, this is Sam De La Rosa. I'm here at Orlando MegaCon. Uh, I want to say hello to the Venom blog, and people can check me out on my social media. It's Art of Sam De La Rosa on both Facebook and Instagram. All right, guys. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today I have an actual discussion, not just me talking about something and no one bouncing ideas back off me. Today I have a guest, someone who's been watching the show for a long time, someone who's been a great friend, someone who checks in on me every once in a while on email, and I'm very grateful for that. This is Venom Unleashed, aka Randy. Say hello, sir, and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, I've known Seek since... Uh, 2019, summer 2019. Uh, we did a little podcast back then, uh, you know. But uh, I'm I'm a huge Venom fan. Mm -hmm. Been a fan since day one. Um, I'm a huge Ben Riley fan since day one as well. So uh, what we're going to be talking about actually hits home for me pretty good. So yeah, I've I got some things to talk about. <laughs> Amen to that. And yes, uh, I didn't say it in the intro, but today what we're discussing is the dark web crossover, which I just finished giving my thoughts on broken into, oh, I think overall like eight or nine videos because I did the road to dark web and then I did four episodes of the dark web. But I, this was something I really wanted to analyze a little bit more and I thought it would be better to have someone with me. And Randy was really cool. He actually reached out to me and offered like, hey, if you want someone to talk, talk you know, someone to talk to you about this crossover. I'd love to because you're a Ben Riley fan like me, because you're a Venom fan. This kind of had, and I'm a big X-Men fan, this had every element I've wanted in a crossover for a couple years now. Oh, yeah. And I think that's why I, me and you, we were trying to be very optimistic about this. I would see comments going, people going, ah, this crossover is going to suck just like the last one. And and I'm like, I don't know. I, I feel like this could, I like Zeb Wells. Like this could be it. And, and I think uh, both of our hearts were broken in this. So I thought this would be a great, a person to talk to about this. And for those who want to listen to our last podcast from 2019, I'm going to put a link to that down below our parasite podcast together. So be sure to check that out too. So Randy, I, we talked about this before the show. I broke this down into five sections because I thought that would just be the best way to move through this and present it in a way that, you know, is different than how I, I did my solo reviews. So we're going to dive in before we get to the real heartbreaking stuff. Cause we, I want to build to that um, and kind of let us go off the, the cuff on that one. We're going to start with section one, which I'm calling the X-Men section. We're going to talk about the three issue miniseries by Jerry Duggan and Rod Reyes. And then also the characters of Madeline Pryor, um, the X-Men that are trapped in limbo during this storyline, which is like Cyclops, Havoc and Jean Grey and Magic. And then also Sink and Forge, who are two characters that were kind of left on the surface on New York fighting, you know, demons and stuff like that. So overall, what are your opinions of the X-Men's portion of, of this crossover and what are your thoughts on Madeline Pryor? Do you have previous love for these characters or, or, you know, or anything like that? Um, I like the X-Men. I do. They're, of course, they're not my favorite, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this first part, uh, with the X-Men, uh, I, I, I wasn't crazy about it at all. Yeah. Um, as for Madeline Pryor, I do have to say that I actually do like her. Um, one of the main reasons is because she is, um, uh, let's see, she is the mother of X Man. That's right. Yep. Nate, Nate Gray. Nate Gray Cable. Okay. Yep. I'm actually a big fan of him as well. And there's, okay. not, there's not too many big fans of, of him, you know, so um, I like him really well. So I do like her, um, you know, but just how we go into things there at the beginning. Uh, it didn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, know. let's make an apple and give everyone their memory, take everyone's memories from them. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Oh, <laughs> as we go, as we go on, I mean, it's just, especially for people that didn't read it or don't know about it. They're going to be like, what? <laughs> right. It doesn't even make sense on a biblical level, like because like Eve eating the apple didn't take her memories away. Uh, or if you're doing like folklore, fairy tales, Snow White's memories weren't taken away when she ate the apple. So I was just like, what's the significance? <laughs> like, yeah. I feel like someone was 
like, oh, this is biblical. It's a theme. Like, you know, eat the apple. Isn't that like, you know, that's that's like a reference. And it's like, do you even know what you're referencing? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The X-Men stuff was for me was uh, I didn't hate their little three issue miniseries overall, but there was so much cringe and bad like moments in it that I did find it very hard to get through. I think the only saving grace for me was at the ending with Madeline Pryor, um, where they they actually convinced her through words that what she was doing was ridiculous. And uh, and then they actually gave her what she wanted without any fuss. You know, like I was like, oh, OK, I didn't see that coming at all. Like, what were what were your thoughts on on that moment where Jean Grey just says, oh, you want those memories? OK, here you go. You know, I mean, that's great and all, but uh, I mean, they. uh <laughs> That, that could have been done like way earlier. Yeah. One issue. <laughs> you could have done it in one issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been, oh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, which, yeah, I, you wouldn't have been able to draw out, you know, the story arc without it. Sure. You know, happening the way that it did. Right. But still, you get, you know, readers going to be like, why didn't they just do that then? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say my biggest criticism of this, and we'll get into it more when we talk about the Spider Man stuff towards the end, but, um, this could have been eight issues. It didn't have to be. This was like 17 issue crossover. Yeah. And, and it didn't have to be at all. It was very yeah. overwritten and drawn out for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I personally am a big generation X fan. So, and I know I'm one of the few on the planet, uh, but sync is a character from that book. And so I was, I was happy to see him. Cause I don't think I've ever, he's never met a symbiote before in comic books, as far as I know. So seeing him deal with venom in that one battle, I thought that was, neat because it was a, a unique power set. It's like, I, I hate when it's Ant-Man versus Yellow Jacket where they have the same powers. Mm -hmm. um, but having someone like uh, Sync who can like almost get in sync with your abilities uh, fighting Venom, I thought that was kind of a neat visual um, battle. I, I, what what are, did you have any thoughts on that? Or were, was that just like, because I also thought it went on too long too. Um, but did you have any thoughts on, or did this make you as a non-Sync fan interested in that character at all? Well, I mean, I thought that it was cool that it happened that way, but then yeah. I got to thinking, okay, he's doing this with the King in Black. Right. Okay. We're talking about like he's literally like a cosmic god. Right. Okay. And he's able to do that. I'm like, you know, it's it's all cool and all, but would he actually be able to do that? You know? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, but I, I thought it was cool. I thought it was really cool. And that power set is really that's, that's something to have in a pinch for sure. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I thought it was cool. I, I didn't find it cringe at all. I, okay. It went on for too long. Yes. But, you know, I, I thought, I thought it was cool. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you, if you put sync again, like in the same room as Galactus, I don't know if sync gets the power cosmic or not. Yeah. Um, or if, if he's around silver surfer, if that happens, like I think there is a threshold that, that sync might not be able to obtain, like you said. And I would agree that venom being a literal God, uh, it's, it can't be easy. Um, but then in this version, they kind of, I guess that's our biggest argument and we'll get there with venom, which is they depowered venom in a big way in this series. Yeah. Um, which I feel like is really weird that they would neuter a character who is a God just because they wanted another grunt for Madeline Pryor. Uh, yeah, yeah. but yeah, that kind of, that kind of, uh, bum me out and forge he's a character i love because when i was getting into x-men it was the storylines with him and uh, storm when they were in love and they he had to make a choice like uh, storm said look or he told storm he's like look either choose the x-men and stay here and i'm gonna leave or come with me and storm at that point was one of the leaders of the x-men and he thought you know what she's just gonna choose the x-men so i'm gonna leave and he leaves before she actually makes her decision and at the end of the issue you find out she was actually gonna choose to leave with forge and uh, and it was a really good heartbreaking issue, but it made me like the character a little bit. But also, you know, I'm like, dude, why would you leave Storm? She's super hot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but in this book, he was just like a guy who created like a plant and shot plant gun stuff at demons. And I was like, ah, I feel like this is such a waste of that character. Uh, what did you think of how they handled Forge in this? Uh, I, I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, does, it's like it's almost like they used him just to take up a little space. You know, sure did. I mean, that, you know, and that's it. And that, and that sucks, especially for Forge fans, you know? Yeah. Which, I mean, 
There's not many of us, but it does suck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they're going to be looking at that like, oh, uh, you know, he he's capable of so much more, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I totally, I would totally understand that, you know. Well, so, To wrap up this X-Men section, let's talk about the main X-Men, because we talked about a little bit Matt Madeline Pryor and stuff, and but she has a relationship with Alex Summers, you know, Cyclops' brother, Havoc. Mm -hmm. We had Havoc... Um, Stuck in limbo with his brother who uh, Cyclops was surrounded by puppies <laughs> and his visor was taken off. So if he opened his eyes, he would be responsible for killing a bunch of puppies, uh, which I thought was creative uh, for a punishment, I guess. Um, yeah. But uh, but then you had Havoc, who was kind of cross-dressing in Madeline's old clothes. Um, and That's then <laughs> and then you had uh, Jean Grey, with who thought she was a child who had never met the X-Men because she was trapped in like a, a memory. And then Magic was also trapped in a childhood memory. So getting those, I, I, we talked about this, like you could have wrapped this up in one issue. I guess the way they prolonged it was they, they reduced the power sets of all those characters. Because any one of those four characters could have stopped Madeline Pryor by themselves. So I got to hear your opinions on like the X-Men just, just being like, you know, thrown through the ringer in limbo by Madeline. Like what are your thoughts on, on that arc? And, and, uh, and obviously we talked about how it ends with Jean Grey, you know, helping Maddie in a way, but just that beginning part, I'd love to hear like if you thought they, that was a good use of the X-Men at all. Uh, definitely not a good use because I mean, with those guys, everyone knows that they're, they're capable of way more. They yeah. could have, they could have took her out. No problem. whatsoever. Yeah. But of course, uh, I understand they had to dumb it down a little bit, you know, take, you know, uh, level down their powers, right? Um, in order for this to happen. So, but still, yet yeah, again, I mean, especially huge X Men fans, they're, they're not gonna like that. You know, that I mean, it's, it, it was, it was disappointing. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, for an event that marketed itself as a Spider-Man Venom X-Men event, yeah, uh, this, it, this yeah, was really. a, yeah, it, it did not do the X-Men too many favors, in no, my opinion. No. Yeah, oh, um, yeah. I, I, are you a fan of like when in crossovers, uh, and we'll just use this as a segue to the next part, which is, um, are you a fan when a lot, not every character, because obviously sometimes crossovers is too many, but when characters get like moments, you know, like a moment to shine, like like if Sync. Sink kind of had a moment fighting Venom, but like Forge, I didn't feel like really had a moment, and some of the other characters didn't have moments. In a in a crossover, how big of a of do you think that's important for these characters to have moments? Uh, in your opinion, I think it's huge, especially with it being in, in such a big crossover. I mean, we're talking Spider Man, X Men, Venom. Uh, that that is some top tier characters, you know. And like with, with the X-Men, you know, they, they're going to, they have some characters that's not as well known. And that would have been a really good uh, point to, you know, focus on them and say, hey, they can do this or they can do that and let them actually have a moment, at least a small moment. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'm definitely all for that, you know, because I mean, that could actually that can make a character. You know, sure could, yeah. I mean, yeah, that that can create some some new fans right there. You know, so I, I think them not not doing so with the, you know with this opportunity, you know, you you you've got these huge characters and you've got you've got all this at at, at your fingertips and you you just don't take the opportunity, and, and to me that's just a great a great big fail. You know, for, yeah, for sure. I mean. And that's a that's a great segue into our next group because, like you said, it, it it could illuminate you to a character. If there's someone who only is reading Spider Man right now, and they're crossing, he's crossing over with the X Men. You would mm -hmm. want the X Men stuff to, as a writer of the X Men stuff, you would almost, in a competitive way, be like, "I'm going to write the best three issue X Men story because I want that Spider Man fan to now pick up X Men every month." You know, um, and I just didn't see that effort, and that leads us into some of these other side characters, which is the second section i want to talk about where we had miss marvel she had a two issue uh a part of the crossover uh we had gold goblin who he technically had three but issue one was not really part of dark web fully um 
but we can still talk about it if you want. So we had Gold Goblin, Miss Marvel, and the MJ and Black Cat crossover, which is still going on, <laughs> even though Dark Web is over. Um, so again, given those characters moments would might make someone go, hey, I want to go read Miss Marvel, or I want to go read X-Men, I want to go read Gold Goblin. With these three characters, what are your thoughts on what they did in the story? And we can go one by one if you want. So you feel free, pick which one you want to start with and, and tell me kind of your thoughts on them in this event. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, okay. We'll start off with, uh, with Miss Marvel. Mm -hmm. Um, <sighs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't, I don't hate the character, mm -hmm. but they have been trying to, uh, get eyes on her and, you know, get, get some, get, get fans behind her. And I totally understand that. And they could, they, you know, they could have done that you know, again, missed opportunity, you know, so, I mean, having her there and her interactions with everybody and everything that she did, it, it, it was, you know, again, underwhelming, you know, it was almost like, why is she even here? You know, yeah. and then some of the things that she did, you're like, there's no way she could have done that. Right. So, and, 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 and I'll, you know, I mean, I could go ahead and, and, point out what what i mean or we could wait till later but no go ahead please yeah what, what, okay for instance when she puts hands on bedlam and she just throws him yeah no, uh -uh. <laughs> no way no <laughs> she didn't just throw him he he bit her and she threw him as a reaction but then she says they're like well you just threw him anywhere he could land anywhere in the city she goes no i i, I purposely aimed him for the hudson so it wasn't like she like it's one thing if he bit her and her reaction was ah and she like you know like an ant bites you and you swing your hand and he just went wherever she still had enough control over the situation by being bit by a giant symbiote that she still aimed him where she threw him uh yeah. in her reaction and i was like oh that's a little too perfect mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah for sure <laughs> um yeah actually i thought you were gonna say the moment where she escaped limbo uh, which was just uh, very, very yeah. convenient. She just like popped up. Like, <laughs> it's like she was there and all of a sudden she's here. Like, uh, that was a little bit too easy, you know, just poof. There she is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like, like you earlier said, like, why is this character even here? It's, it's a real shame because she actually has a purpose in a way, like to make sense for her to be included in the story she's like an assistant for Peter Parker at Oscorp, yeah. you know? So it's like, okay, it, okay. I get why she's here, but what are you doing with her while she's here? Exactly. And, and she just kind of shows up to be in the Venom book. She shows up as a know-it-all. She's just like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to be the, the, the mature one out of all these like children symbiote. And I'm like, okay. But, and then she just seems to have a full grasp of the situation and then leaves them and then joins Norman and then enters the final battle riding in on the goblin glider with Norman. And I'm like, none of this, this all just feels so random. And then in her book, she's, you know, she's talking to this boy and who's like hitting on her. And I'm like, just put that in her main book, give her like one person she's trying to save in these two issues so that we know the stakes for her personally. And then, and then have her go through whatever, you know, journey you have her in these two issues. And this was like, no, we got to have the boyfriend thing. And then we got to have the, the, the temple or the mosque that came to life and we got to do that. And then we got to bring miles in for 10 seconds, you know, and you're it's like, Oh my God, it was just all over the place. And and speaking of miles, he didn't even get to be a part of this series outside of her book. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, that could have, that really could have been, been a, a really good part as well, you know, but then again, I mean, he ha he hasn't been written very well for a while. So, I mean, <laughs> that's true. Although, although I, I'm kind of liking what Cody's doing a little bit on the current book. Um, so I'm I'm curious to see how it crosses over with Carnage soon, uh, the Miles book. Yeah. Um, but I I, I feel you yeah, though. I, it, it, Miles is a great character in animated movies. I think that animated film is probably my best, my favorite version of Miles. And I liked him in the video game. And the yeah. comics just seemed to really struggle with him. Um, yeah. So what are you, what were your thoughts? Cause you, you know, people listen to this, they know I love this series. So, uh, cause I'm a big Jed McKay fan. Did you read the Mary Jane and black cat stuff? Did you like that at all? I know we can't talk about the ending, but, <laughs> uh, well, 
I mean, I like that they're, that they're trying to do something with them. Sure. And, yeah. And, and of course it, it was unique and, it, and they've always seemed to like have like a, uh, oh, almost like a, maybe a little bit of a friendship partnership, but you know, they're kind of like not besties. Right. Because of Peter Parker. Um, but let me say this. Okay. Uh, their little series that is, like you said, is still going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the power set that they give Mary Jane. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I seen that and I was like, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is I've been reading Spider-Man Monthly and I don't think it ever became as clear of what her powers were until this miniseries. And then I was like, oh, that's what she's been doing this whole time? Like, <laughs> So yeah. I don't know if I just wasn't paying attention or if Jed McKay was just better at making it like like dumbing it down for me. Um, but I was like, oh, oh, it's so she's literally a jackpot machine. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right. That makes sense. Oh. I do like the, the added twist they put in there is that black cat, I think, is back to having that ability where people around her have bad luck. So I do kind of like that, that she's like, Mary Jane, I need your help. And Mary Jane's like, dude, every time I use my powers, I get one of the skulls. So I don't get a good power. And I become like a fart cloud or something or, <laughs> or, or vomit. And I'm like, just that dynamic is like, that's where I think Jed McKay's mind works really well. And where I think his mind struggles in this is that they're like, hey, take that idea and put it into dark web. And he's like, ah, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like just, they should have just let him write a, a Mary Jane and Black Cat, another miniseries with them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know the, uh, the, the first, uh, uh, series they did was actually pretty popular. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it was really, really well liked. Um, you know, with this though, I mean, her, like I, like I was talking about, her power set is just <laughs> wacky. So weird. It's it's wacky. <laughs> it's a good word for it. I remember looking through and I was like, is that like a slot machine? Like <laughs> is that what's right. going on here? Right. You know, it's just uh, it's like a roll of the dice, you know, you, you get this power or you get that power. I mean, it's weird. <laughs> it's it's so strange. Um yeah, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm so bored of kind of what's happening in Spider-Man right now that I don't even care to read the current issues where they're finally explaining uh, the, the backstory of how Mary Jane got powers and how her and Peter aren't together anymore. And I'm like, I don't care. I, you, you took too long. you know. Yeah. Um, so speaking of that and tying into Peter Parker and stuff, the last side character we had in this was Gold Goblin. Um, he did have two connecting uh, issues, but then he also showed up in the first Dark Web issue where Ben Riley just cleaned his clock, like oh. just took him down big time. Oh. Um, as a Ben Riley fan, that moment had to be satisfying for you because it was for me. I loved it. Oh yeah, um, you know, get getting to see Ben actually do something like this, even though he's a villain. Right. I, you know, I don't care. I'm always going to be a big Ben Riley fan, always. Amen. And um, you know, getting to see him do that, yeah, that was awesome because this is what I think about is uh, um, Norman is the one that originally killed Ben. Right. So him getting all these hits in on, on uh, Norman. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So he deserved that. That's for sure. I agree. I with Ben being the villain now and Norman being the good guy. Um, yeah. It was cool to see those roles reverse. And then the bad guy just cleaning the good guy's clock again. Yeah. But when he's just hitting, and the thing is, it sucks. I like, I wish Ben did have the memories of his. He said he's like, I remember some things uh, about you killing me, but I don't remember everything. I kind of wish he did remember everything because I feel like it would have been more satisfying to Ben. Uh, but for us as readers, I know I was like, oh, every punch, I was like, yes. <laughs> Here's the thing: if he if he had remembered that, yeah, the beating he gave Norman would have been way worse. He would have killed Norman. Oh my God. Yeah, it would have yeah. been way worse. Oh, for sure. He would have just put a pumpkin bomb in his mouth and just detonated. Oh it, man. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. He he'd be standing body parts of family members. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normie's birthday was in issue three, so he just send his head to yeah, Normie. <laughs> there you go. Oh, look, it's a helmet. Oh, there's something in there. <laughs> yeah, it's an Iron Patriot helmet with your dad's head in it. <laughs> oh my God. What a gift. <laughs> what a gift. <laughs> He's like, oh man, me and Boba Fett have something in common now. 
Um, <laughs> um, well, there is one side character that was missing in this that I think could have added a lot to the story. And once again, Marvel acts like this guy doesn't exist, which is uh, how do you tell Ben Riley's story without Kane? And uh, I would have really liked oh. to see Kane get a two issue series in this to, and play a part. Okay, so um, I recently read something mm -hmm. and I've been asking this. I have been throwing this question out for years now to whoever last wrote Kane mm -hmm. or wherever he was involved, what title, whatever. I've been throwing out like, where is Kane? Yeah. Where is the Scarlet Spider? No answers. <laughs> no answers. Now I know. And a lot of other people know you. May, you may not know yet. I mean, I can I can spoil it for you if you want. But I, you know what? I do want to be spoiled. This is actually exciting because I the last time he appeared was in Peter David's Scarlet Spider run with Ben Riley. Yeah. So where has he been since issue twenty five of that book? Okay, so the Spider Verse stuff that's going on right now. Uh huh. Um, or they're calling the death of the Spider Verse. Right. Okay. Have you read any of those issues? I have the first issue, um, but I, I haven't read beyond that yet. I was going to wait for the trade. Okay. After the Spider-Verse issues ended, it went into the new uh, Spider-Man okay. uh, title. Yep. It's, it's called Spider-Man. Right. Um, so you have these characters. I can't remember what you call them, but mm -hmm. they were going around and killing all of the uh, Spider-Power oh, people. The Inheritors or something like that? No, 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 no. Oh, they're, they're they almost they're like they kind of look like ants or wasps. Oh, something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, there's like this kind of a a dagger that they would use, and it would so called kill them and send them like to another reality or pocket dimension or something like that. Sure. And they would have one of them take the place of that character. Oh, well, like a scroll kind of. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but that, that didn't happen with Kane. It, it, it made it very, very weird how, how they went about it. Anyway, so the end of the Spider-Verse arc, mm -hmm. um, they defeat, I, ca I can't remember her, her name, but okay. she gets defeated and, um, you know, they're like, okay, if we use this dagger, we can bring back everybody that they took. So okay. they're bringing everybody back. Like, like Sp Spider Woman was one of them. She okay. was one of the first to go. Oh. Uh, so was uh, Spider Man Noir. He was another one. Okay. Um, so they brought him back. So all these characters are coming back. So out of nowhere, nobody's expecting it. It's like this, uh, it's almost kind of like a whirlwind comes down, and there's Kane as a Scarlet Spider. And over top of him in big letters, it says the Scarlet Spider. No, he's, he's officially back. So yeah. he's just been gone this whole time, yeah. uh, stabbed by that knife. Yes. Interesting. Well, yes. I got to say, I mean, not that I love it, but it does. It's an answer. And that's all I really wanted was an answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that makes sense why he wasn't involved probably in King and Black and now and now Dark Web. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, well, you know what? I'll accept that answer. And I'm actually glad you told me because. Now maybe I'll just go and pick up those issues and and uh, and read about them. Yeah, I, um, I'm a huge Kane fan as well. Yeah, um, I mean, l like you know, after after Ben, but I, I I've been wondering for such a long time, where is Kane? Yeah, no kidding. You know, I mean, yeah. come on, guys, what the hell? <laughs> but there, well, there we go. There's the answer. He's back, dude. I love it. Hey, you just made my day. Actually, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> beyond just talking to you. Now this is now it's like another layer. I got I got ice cream on top and chocolate you know, drizzled all over it now. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this issue just come out this past Wednesday. All right, everyone, so if you like, haven't read it yet, go yeah. get it, man. Kane is back. I'm going to go buy a copy. I need to have it. It is Spider-Man issue number seven. Spidey seven. Okay. You yes. got it. Cool. Yeah. All right, everyone go pick up a copy and uh, yeah, I'm going to go get, uh, I'm going to get one on Wednesday when I go get my new books in. Um, so excellent. Um, now, Talking about Kane, I'm glad we got to talk about him because I, I, I've i been missing the hell out of that guy. Oh, yeah. Um, but there was another section I wanted to talk about as part of this crossover that I didn't really get into in the main book uh, or my main episodes when I was talking about him, which is the locations. Uh, this story obviously takes place primarily in Limbo and New York City. So I just I want to hear your thoughts and I, I'm going to give some too, uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you think they handled 
like these two realms in this series. Like, because I'm starting to feel like New York is almost like a, just a punching bag. It's not even like a real place anymore. It's just a punching bag for King and Black events to happen and and absolute carnage events. And there doesn't seem to be real repercussions. Like after King and Black, they were like, hey, we're going to now hunt symbiotes. And you had the new toxin attached to a kid and his dad is a member of the jury. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is a new status quo for the, the symbiotes, uh, you know, having this type of story. And then they just abandoned it for this time travel nonsense. So yeah. what are your thoughts on how they portray New York, the civilians in it and limbo and the creatures within limbo and how they interact on earth? Um, with New York, it, yeah. it, they do portray it, it. It pretty much is like a, like a punching bag. Um, they just use it over and over and it's pretty much the same thing. Just a little bit of a different visual, um, you know, different characters, uh, but pretty much it's the same thing over and over. Um, you know, so, I mean, it, it sucks that they do that, but I mean, they've gotten so used to doing that. It's just like a thing that they do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I know these characters exist there. I, so I, I get it. It's, it's, it's just, it feels natural, but yeah. at the same time, I, I'm always wondering how do people who live in this New York feel about like, do they still just tough it out and go to school if symbiotes are raining from the sky or, or their lunch boxes are turning into demons. Like <laughs> what, what yeah, do you think how, happens? How does an everyday, <laughs> an everyday <laughs> Joe yeah. that lives in New York, how do they go from day to day? I mean, Oh my God, it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause like Wednesday you have the symbiotes raining down from the sky. And then a week later you have a celestial standing in the middle of times square judging everyone. And then a week after that you have carnage attacking again. And then a week after that you have scrolls and it's like, dude, what do you do? <laughs> Rent needs uh, to drop in New York. <laughs> uh, I know exactly what I would do. Yeah. My ass would be moving. <laughs> Leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Force the Avengers to move to North Carolina or something. You know, it's yeah. like. <laughs> go, go, some, go somewhere very rural. Yeah. You know, just, uh, oh, my God. But that, that would be my thoughts. I'd be like, let's, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be a fun, like, eight-page story or miniseries. Or not, even, not maybe just a single issue. It's just the whole time someone trying to move out of New York. <laughs> but uh, they yeah. like they they rent a u-haul truck and then the sentinels attack and their u-haul just destroyed they're like <laughs> yeah and it's like all right all right I'm, I'm gonna next week we're gonna load you know we'll get another u-haul next week when the streets are cleaned up and then then we'll get out of new york and then next week you know uh uh you know mole man attacks and they're like god dang it <laughs> that would be a, a fun joke to do for like an eight issue story the end the end of it i'd be like you know what screw all this this is getting a car let's go <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, or just see one of the superheroes, they see Iron Man, they're like, please fly me out of the city. <laughs> um, oh my god, yeah, and then and limbo, like, uh, that's the other thing is like, I, I'm a Ghost Rider fan, and I've, I've, you know, even as recently as the last Ghost Rider run, which was like a year and a half, two years ago, where they had Belasco and he was in charge of limbo. I know Magic got it back, and then she gave it to Madeline Pryor because the X Men books have kind of escalated that. But even Limbo feels like it's not like it doesn't feel like Limbo um, when I'm reading it. It just feels like um, it kind of became whatever they wanted it to be for the story. And I guess you can do that. That's kind of what creativity is. But this whole thing of like Madeline going, all right, my plan with Ben is to get Peter Parker to eat an apple and to, for me to get Jean Grey to use a device so I can get her memories. It just seems so elaborate. And then to make like, you know, mailboxes and basketball courts to turn into monsters. And, you know, it's like, it seems so random and, and over the top, even for two clones who just feel jilted by people. Um, you know, so what was your take on limbo and how they kind of, how they invade earth and, and, and what their, I guess, purpose is in the story? Um, yeah. Like, like with the mailboxes and, and, and stuff like that, trying to attack people. I mean, it's, you know, in one way, it, it could be like a cool visual, sure. but it's so weird. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and like with the, when Spider-Man's fighting with a mailbox, I mean, really? <laughs> yeah. 
There's that one where vet where is a venom where like a the, the baby carriage had a baby in it and it was yeah. trying to swallow the baby and venom saved the baby. Um, I mean, yeah, like you're right, it makes for goofy and funny visuals. Um, yeah. Yeah. and I'm sure it's something like an artist like Ed McGinnis, who's been around for a long time and has drawn a lot. It's like, hey, this is different. I've never really done something like this before, but I don't know, man. Like, I, I just thought this whole thing was it was like goofy times 10. Oh, yeah. With Limbo itself, mm -hmm. it almost seemed like it almost seemed like it become a place to just for like uh, Madeline Pryor and Ben, um, you know, to just hang out, like right. it, like yeah, like, like it, your like hideout. It, yeah. yeah, like, like yeah. It, it just wasn't even like you know, ooh, it's Limbo, you know, but no, they're just like just hanging out and making plans and stuff, you know. <laughs> You know, talking about people eating this apple or that apple, and we're going to do this, you know. So, you know, compared to any other version of Limbo that we've seen, it, yeah, it, it didn't it didn't hold up. I mean, it was kind of a joke, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, and even in the Black Cat miniseries, they they they're obviously still in Limbo, uh, Black Cat and Mary Jane. But the rules are that someone has to be holding some kind of item. So, like, uh, Magic had a sword before that. Belasco had his sword. Madeline now has this scythe and they kept saying, Oh, someone has to have this weapon of massive power to essentially be seen as royalty. And then in the end, which we'll get to more about, but just to talk about this in the limbo part, they break that rule in this book by, uh, there's a moment where Maddie is like, I don't need the scepter because Ben has it. She's like, the demons are just going to listen to me because I say so. And I'm like, but I thought the whole point, then why doesn't Belasco just take over again? <laughs> like, why does he need to go get his sword? Um, so it just kind of all falls apart uh, the more these these guys try to write it in a clever way. Um, so yeah, it, it bummed me out. And, and as a Ghost Rider fan and someone who's a fan of like what they try to set up with Limbo and other places with Dan Ketch and stuff, it was so weak. I just, I didn't like it at all. Yeah. It, it, they kind of made it a joke. I mean, it yeah. was, you know, you, you couldn't take something like that seriously. Like, like in another story arc, it would be such a big, a big deal. Like a, you know, a, a place that you would want to avoid. You know what I'm saying? Right. Oh, yeah. uh, like you wouldn't want to go there and hang out, you know? Right. So, but yeah, it, it, it was just kind of, kind of a joke, honestly. I think so too. I feel like this whole book has been, or this whole crossover feels like a bunch of people trying to write a Rick and Morty episode for Spider-Man and they have no idea what it, they don't have the talent to write a Rick and Morty episode. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, they're like, Oh, see, we're goofy. Like Rick and Morty. It's like, it's not just being goofy though. There's like a science to it. Um, and a talent that you guys don't have. Um, and that actually, you, cause you kind of mentioned it too, but that brought in other characters. Speaking of like limbo, just being a hangout place that brought in, uh, in the section four, we're going to talk about the newbies. We got some new characters in this book. Uh, we got the insidious six, which are six demons from limbo that Ben created somehow using Madeline's powers um, for no reason at all, other than to reference the Spider-Man nineties cartoon, I think. Um, then we got rec rap, which is a bizarro Spider-Man demon. Um, and then we got all Hallows Eve, which is Janine, uh, her, uh, the girlfriend of Ben Riley, who I'm glad they brought her back by the way. And beyond, I thought that was cool as a Ben fan uh, that they finally got her out of jail, but her getting these powers, like let's start with her because everyone heard my thoughts. I got to hear what you think about, Madeline Pryor just coming up with these random powers for Janine and calling her All Hallows Eve. Okay. Um, <laughs> with, with, with her, uh -huh. um, I, I, I like Janine. I like her really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as I said before, I've been a Ben Riley fan since the beginning, and she's been there almost since the beginning for him, with him. Um, which her first appearance was in the uh, Spider-Man Lost Years series. Mm -hmm. Great series. Um, you know, so going way back then, her, her being, you know, um, a, a character that is so tied uh, to Ben Riley, you know, I really do like her. Um, and then th the, the powers that they give her, the way that it comes about is very weird. <laughs> um and her powers in general are weird. <laughs> <laughs> um break down her powers for people listening who don't know. Okay, so pretty much um she has power like she's got these masks, 
like Halloween masks. Mm -hmm. And whatever mask she puts on, she becomes that character. Like Frankenstein or a werewolf, <laughs> you know, something like that. She becomes that. She becomes like super powerful and her body uh, changes. Like she, like with Frankenstein, she becomes real tall and she's very bulky and, you know, she's really strong, you know, and it's, it's just so weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but. I do have to say, like, the character of All Hallows' Eve herself. Mm -hmm. Just herself without putting on the masks right. or something like that. She actually has a great look. I agree. A hundred percent. She actually right. has a really great look. And the, her personality, no, not including the masks, is something that you could work with as a villain. You know, something could really be done with her. But all these goofy masks and all these goofy characters they have her portray, you know, it just, it, you can't take it seriously. Yeah. You know, you, you just can't, you know, but again, I, I like Janine, but I think that they could do better. Yeah. If, if, if they do something with Kane now that he's back um, in like a, another book and if the, the all hollows Eve, if you read that, um, let me know because I heard her series, her mini series is about her trying to break Ben out of limbo. Right. So, uh, so if, if that happens, maybe we'll have to do another one of these after that series ends. And, and if we get more info or more stuff about, you know, Kane, um, I'd love to have you back and talk non symbiotes and just talk about, you know, those clones. Cause that would be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So, okay. So we got, we got Al Hallows Eve and yeah, I agree. I think her look is cool. And if you just gave her like a power of like, you know, she flies and, and can, uh, like, I don't know, you give her like a single power, you know, whatever, like that, that would have been way better. I don't like the mask thing at all. Um, but, uh, but we did get a new kind of symbiote in this story and then we got more demons. Uh, so wreck rap, uh, I had people in the comments actually say they really like this character. I like the setup for him and that he's like, you know, what his backstory is, which I'll let you talk about. Um, but, uh, what are your thoughts on wreck rap, the reverse Spider-Man Peter Parker? Well, he was literally just a demon in limbo, and he was like a very frail demon, a little <laughs> little guy. Like, but he wanted to do good, right? You know, and um, he was able to get powers to 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 the point to where he could actually do something. He he got big. He actually reminds you of Venom in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, he don't have pointy teeth, but he's got big square chiclets. <laughs> yeah, know? he sure does. Like the thing. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, but you know, that character it could work with a with a right writer. I can um, agree to that. Yeah. It, it it could it could definitely work. The look, I, I I like the look. Okay. Um, it does remind me of Venom. You know, but he's goofy as hell. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean he is he's beyond goofy <laughs> he sure is yeah you know? so i mean i think definitely something could be done with him but his involvement in the series uh you know other than the look mm -hmm. as as about as far as i can go you know yeah. i mean he everything was just so damn goofy in this series <laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually it's funny. I would love for them to take your quote of just the word goofy and put it on the back of the trade paperback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you, go. <laughs> you know, like just goofy. goofy. <laughs> I mean, hey, and if you like goofy, this is you're gonna love this series, you know. Exactly. Um, and if you don't, you're gonna pick at it, you know. Like I like I, I appreciate goofy things, but there has to be some things that aren't goofy for the goofy stuff to feel like they matter. Right. And I felt like this book was like every idea. They're like, okay, that's a good idea. Now let's make it goofy, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and rec rap was one of those. Um, cause the, it, the idea, like, well, first of all, the idea of everything in limbo being bad is stupid because limbo is limbo. It's, it's the, it's a balance. It's not about demons because they're in hell and it's not about angels cause they're in heaven. So limbo is a place that whoever is in charge, you know, they're, you're going to have, they're going to have a following, you know, of, of whatever minions are in limbo. They're going to follow that person in charge. But I, limbo has been portrayed differently where it's ma mainly just empty space a lot of times too. Um, like in midnight suns, that's a great example. Uh, you're going through limbo there and it's just empty space. You know, it's, it's not really a place to chill, <laughs> you right. know? Um, 
it's almost like a punishment for like a Belasco where you're like, okay, you're powerful, but we don't want to give you hell. We don't want to put you in heaven. So we're going to just put you in the void of limbo. Um, them creating these villains and Ma uh, Ben using Madeline's powers, which is literally such a waste that even Madeline says it when Ben creates the insidious six, <laughs> uh, what are your, we got rec rap out of the way. And, and I agree. I think in the right hand, someone could probably write a really fun story with that character. Yeah. Um, because like Venom, he's got a misguided sense of right and wrong. You right. know? So, so I think you're right about that. I think that's, that would be great. And you could even probably put him in the all Hallows Eve miniseries and uh, have him buddy up with her for an issue or two. Um, but the insidious six, I, yeah, I got to hear your thoughts on these. These guys are, they're not just goofy. They're wacky as hell. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> well, with these, with these guys, they're literally just, again, goofy yeah. knockoffs of the Sinister Six. Right. That, that's, uh, you can tell which one is supposed to be Doc Ock. You can right. tell which one's supposed to be the Green Goblin. I mean, you know, but they're just, <laughs> they look like cabbage patch kid versions or, or whatever of uh of those in of the the sinister six you know um, i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you the one that's supposed to be like doc ock uh -huh. he looks like a damn mad ball he does <laughs> he does <laughs> that's a good call he does actually they look so strange i mean it, it, you know again by this point in the book when they're introduced i'm not i'm I'm not even surprised by anything anymore. Cause by that point it's we're in the final act. Everything's been goofy. Um, yeah. So when they came in, I was kind of like, Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, or that makes sense, I guess for this book. Um, yeah. But the fact that Ben created them, I mean, I thought that was interesting because Ben, like I, I'm, I'm, they're very, and we're going to get into the Ben stuff here. Cause we're almost done with this section, but it's like, does he remember his life or does he not? How does he know what the Sinister Six are if he has no memories, you know, to wow. create the Insidious Six? So you could poke holes in some of the stuff if you really cared. I mean, I call that stuff still nitpicky stuff. But um, I don't know. These guys were, they were bonkers. That's another word for them. Bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Would you read a miniseries <laughs> with the Insidious Six in it? Ooh, it all depended on... Uh, what if they fought Wreck Rap? What if Wreck Rap was, had to go hunt down the insidious six and defeat them. And it was, was a writer, a writer you liked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd pick it up. Yeah. What, what's a writer you like that you would, that you think would do good on that? I would say, uh, if I, my favorite writer, which mm -hmm. it, there's no way in hell this is going to happen. That's okay. Um, but my favorite writer of all time is Tom McFarlane. Okay. Right. You writer, know? not just artist. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, if it was my choice and I, you know, I would put him on, actually I'd have him doing both the art and the writing of, of rec rap versus insidious six. Yes. That, yeah. Dude, dude, that would be awesome. Can you imagine how, what rec rap would look like if top far? Oh, sure. Him? Yeah. He would, he would be intense looking, but like in a silly way. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think they're out there. I think some, something like that would grab, uh, new fans bigger than shit. <laughs> I think that would make everyone go, Really? <laughs> yeah, and then they'd go, oh, I guess I'm buying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you, can you imagine um, them doing a cover swap where <laughs> Rick Rap is on top and uh, Chasm is on the bottom, like with like, like with ASM 316? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. There you go. There you go. That's That'd pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. Um, or if they did like a one of the maximum carnage uh, covers where carnage is like holding everyone up like almost like puppets and like a oh, web, yeah. and you just have all the insidious six in the web and wreck wrap up here, like you know doing this. Um, oh yeah, yeah, you could do a lot of fun stuff with that. Uh, that's cool, actually. Yeah, I know that's what I asked though. Was I wanted to know what your dream, the dream team for your wreck wrap versus insidious six? And and you're right. I if if Todd announced that like you know a month from now, I'd be like, oh I'm, if, oh it's a one shot. I'm buying it. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I would buy every cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, he would get Capullo. He'd get all these guys to do covers for him. You know? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. People you haven't seen do Marvel stuff in a while, which would be awesome. Yeah. Um, but he, he's my all time favorite writer. So he would be the one I would put on it, but okay. I would also put him on the art, you know, the art. Okay. Um, uh, art wise besides him, 
I would also go with like Ryan Stegman. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, another one that I love that not too many people may not be a fan of, but uh, I love San- Sandoval. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, Sandoval. Yeah. I, I love, yeah. I love, especially the way he, he, he draws Spider-Man or any of the symbiotes. He's good. You're right. He's, you know, I, I love that. Cause he did work on the Costa run, which was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I could. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I got one for you. Okay, I got, I got one for you that would actually work. Hit me. Okay, the art would be done by Ryan Stegman. Okay. Okay. The writer would be Daniel Way. You know what? It's so funny because I was like waiting, and I was like, I'm gonna let him, you know, give his his list. Daniel Way was at the top of my list to write it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that guy is. He got. I'm not a big Deadpool fan. I love Daniel Way Deadpool. And I actually like Daniel Way's Ghost Rider run he did around the time he was working on Deadpool. Yeah. Um, that guy is very talented. I like him a lot. Good call. Yeah. Uh, that 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 would be like like as in actually getting done. Yeah. That would be that would be my team. He's good. Yeah, I agree. I think Daniel Way would be my top list for writer on this because of his humor. And uh, but for art style, who does wacky, I love the artist who did Sinister Spider-Man, uh, which is Chris Bacallo. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I love his style. It is not for everybody, but he he finds a, a an interesting blend b- between manga, madness, and humor. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that would give some good energy to a, a story like like a Rec Rap versus Insidious Six. Uh, oh oh oh! I got another one. For okay, hit me. That would fit perfect. All right, what is it? Scotty Young. Oh, of course, Scotty. Yeah. He's got to. <laughs> he's got to do all the covers too, man. He's got oh, that guy's I, amazing. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, just just make it a kids book then. Make it an all ages kids book and have oh. Scotty Young do it. Um, that would be. That's the demographic right there. Uh, I, I think that would be a hit. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, all right. Well, now that we had all of our fun, let's get to the moment where our hearts are just going to come out of our chests and. We're going to rip them apart in front of each other. <laughs> this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be so bad, man. Um, hearing your dream team and everything. Now we're going back to reality where we did not have, I feel a dream team on this book. So for our final section, we're going to talk about the main three characters, chasm, venom, and Spider-Man. And I can't think of a better segue than letting you take the floor and kind of giving your, your overall feedback and criticisms, you know, direct it to whoever you want to direct to, but, you know, tell everyone knows how I feel about this book. I did nine episodes on it. I want to hear from you now. Hit us with your your honest opinions about the creative team, missed opportunities, the story they told, whatever you want to get off your chest. I want to hear it, man. First of all, by some chance, if Zeb Wales happened to listen to this, mm-hmm. I want to tell him you suck. Oh, uh, you suck. Oh, I love okay. you, Zeb, but I agree. <laughs> Dude, oh my God. You, oh, that the fir- from the first issue, I was like, oh no. Oh man. Dude, oh, talk about ripping the heart out, man. Because I was, I was looking forward to this so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, because uh, you're going to, for me, you're going to have Venom and Ben Riley crossing paths again. And it's yeah. been so long. Yeah, if that happened, I was looking forward to this, and also with with him portraying a new character as Chasm, I, I dug the outfit. I think the outfit is great. I agree. Um, you know, I think he looks just badass, and I was just looking forward to this so much, and to how everything ends up happening. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, for for fans like us, yeah, he might as well just rip the damn heart out. Um, because not only, um, you know, did they do this to Ben? I mean, he never gets the win. Ben never right. gets the win ever, you know, and they done him dirty yet again, you know, so that, that bothered me quite a bit. Okay. We'll get to Venom. Um, yeah. all of that character development. Okay. That Donnie Kate started up till now okay all of that and they go and they turn him into the goofy 90s venom you know like he has he 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 has it's almost like he has no idea why he's there except for spider-man 
you know, and they got him there like he's just mindless. He's stupid, but he still wants to save, you know, people, you know, but he, he was just, I was thinking we're going to go into this. He's, he's going to be himself. He's going to be, you know, he's a God. He's going to really be able to help out. He's going to do something big. No, no, they, they dumbed him down so bad, you know, I um, mean, and, and how, how, how does somebody, you know, even if it's Ben or, or Madeline, how are they going to do that to a God? Like how, you know what I'm saying? Um, oh yeah. I, you know, I, I, I just, I just don't, I don't get it. Um, you know, and that was something that a lot, a lot of people I've talked to, it was, you know, it was such a letdown that, mm-hmm. it, you know, I mean, you know, it, it sucked. Yeah. What about Spidey? Uh, what are your thoughts on anything they did with him in this series? Uh, you know, there, there actually wasn't a whole bunch that went on between Spidey Madeline and Ben. There wasn't too much. True. There was, um, you know, because Ben spent spent a lot of time with Norman. He spent a lot of time with Madeline. You know, um, he spent a lot of time uh, in limbo. You know, but it, you know what? What he he and Spidey had one fight, literally. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, they had one in the middle of of the run, like an Amazing Spider-Man issue, uh, before Chasm sent him to limbo. And then they had some verbal arguments after that for an issue or two. And then they kind of clashed right before Ben became the king of limbo, yeah. uh, King Chasm. Um, but once he became King Chasm, Spider-Man pretty much couldn't touch him. And uh, and Spider-Man doesn't even get the winning moment over Ben in this story. Right, right. Uh, yeah, Madeline just, well, first off, Al Hallows Eve just randomly grabs the scythe from Madeline like it's nothing and gives it to Ben. And then later Madeline takes it from Ben like it's nothing. And you're just like, Oh, wow. <laughs> how exciting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how is she just going to take that from, from Madeline? I mean, yeah, you sure. know what I'm saying? And uh, then how does Madeline take it from Ben? It's just like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. She just gets it, you know, just like it, it's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. No tactics. No, nothing used. It's just, we got five pages left in this book. We got to end it. <laughs> yeah. You, you can always tell when they're being rushed. Uh-huh. Uh, um, like for instance, with uh, with Donnie Cates, mm-hmm. um, with the end of the uh, the Venom run and the King and Black uh, series and all of that, I honestly think that they were rushed. I, I don't think it was supposed to happen the way that it was originally supposed to happen. I hope not, because that book I didn't like the ending of that book. Yeah, I really think I think that they may have been rushed. And um, the story that was that they were wanting to tell, they couldn't. So, yeah, you know. and that happens. That does happen. And I, and I try to I'm glad you factor that in because I try to factor that in my reviews, too. When you got a big crossover like this, it's like, well, when it's like um, it's like filmmaking. If you go write a book like, you know, Moon Knight, mostly people will leave you alone. Editors and, you know, top brass at Marvel. People kind of just like, hey, go go tell your Ghost Rider story. Go tell your Moon Knight or Blade story. You get on a book like Spider-Man or Avengers, you got more people involved, you know, and uh, and sometimes you don't get the final say on everything, which is fine because, you know, it's their characters. Obviously, you shouldn't probably on some level have final say, but there are some times where you kind of want to see, well, OK, what would that writer really have done? You know, and uh, and some writers are good at that. Like I think um, like, uh, you know, uh, like Bendis somewhat, you know, but uh, like Jeff Johns, I thought in his heyday on Green Lantern, he was one of those guys that editors could give him ideas and he might take them. But I think he pretty much had a grasp of like what you could and couldn't do with certain characters, you know? Yeah. And so that let him be free in his writing. Cause he's like, Oh, I know I can't do this with John Stewart or that with Kyle Rayner. I know I'm going to get, you know, blowback on that. Like Kevin Smith said that when he wrote uh, Batman cacophony, he's like, I knew I couldn't have Batman just naked running through the bat cave, you know, and showing his junk off. And he's like, I knew I couldn't do that in my book. So I'm not going to write that, you know? And so sometimes you just know what your limits are and it makes you a good writer um, because you play within that sandbox. And I think there's sometimes like this where it's like, I feel like Zeb Wells and the creative team behind this should have really thought about the sandbox and what they were playing in. Because I think 
for a story that took 17 issues or 16 issues to to flesh out it feels like it could have been done in eight yet every issue feels like they were running out of page count i'm like not everything in here is needed like why are you why are you fleshing this out and cramming this you know and that's how ev- almost every issue of this book felt like to me and i don't know if you agree with that or not yeah oh yeah yeah i definitely yeah with what you said about zeb wells like i i defend the guy i like some of his writing but this book and the spider-man book in general has really surprised me as a fan of his. I, I I gotta say I'm not liking what he's done here. And again, it's just our opinions, right? Like if he is listening, I hope he's not offended. We're just here to just explain, uh, you know, and why we're part of a, a chorus of people who have not liked this crossover. Um, yeah. But in this, I feel like there because there's missed opportunities because it was overwritten in, in certain areas that could have been condensed and underwritten in areas that should have been expanded on. It does. It does fall into this trope that i hate um uh, paul w s anderson have you are you a resident evil fan by chance yes i am awesome good well let's talk very much very much so i'm going to take a slight detour here and compare this story to resident evil and you'll see what i mean um resident evil 4 afterlife is probably my guilty pleasure resident evil movie because it has chris and claire and wesker it has all the right parts in it even though none of them are written well or anything um but it has all, enough parts to where I go, okay, this feels a little bit like the game. Well, in Resident Evil Afterlife and Resident Evil 4, um, I felt like the biggest thing that sucked was that you have Claire, who now has amnesia, and she runs into a guy who says, hey, I'm your brother. And it's like, well, then why have Chris in the movie at all if she has amnesia and doesn't remember him? Uh, because that doesn't pay off later. Later on, they just go, oh, yeah, we're brother and sister. And then they shoot Wesker. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's not like a big moment. So in this one, I'm like, why have Ben fight um, Gold Goblin or Norman Osborn? Why have Ben beat up Venom and, and help brainwash him? Um, why have him do all these things and create the Sinister Six or Insidious Six if he doesn't have any memories of it? It's 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 really odd that they are like, we got this great Ben Riley story we're going to tell where he's a villain. Dude, if you told a good Ben Riley story where he's a villain, I, yeah, I wouldn't like him being a villain. But if you did it well, you would get me to put my foot in my mouth. Uh, this book was like, they always, you know, I know comic book making is hard. I've talked about this with you before the stream. I've written some and it's it's not easy. And sometimes you think you did your best and people hate it anyway. You can't please everyone. And I understand that. But when you disappoint this many people, because we're not alone, you and I, I actually looked this up and seen other people's reviews. I rarely, I don't think I've seen a single positive review of this comic book series, this crossover. So in your opinion, as a fan and as someone who's like ingesting this, like what, what, do you have any like feedback that other than like what you said, which I thought was fantastic about like what they could learn from this, that they could do better in the next one. Cause I've said all mine in my videos. And then what I just said there about why have Ben here, if he has no memories of this anyway, why involve him? save that for another character and you know, replace Ben. I mean, this story, if you just wanted to make Madeline Pryor, the limbo embassy leader of New York, you could have just told a Madeline Pryor miniseries. You didn't need to cross over with Venom and Spider-Man. You didn't have to involve all these characters. You could have done that by itself. So what are some things that you think they can take away and and, and learn from this book and do hopefully better next time? Well, one thing I would do is look at the criticism, look at what the the fans are saying. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got these super rich characters you've got spider-man you've got ben riley you've got venom Mm -hmm. i mean these characters have millions of fans yeah okay so you've got this and and, and there's so much you can do there's so much known about these characters Mm -hmm. that you could put you could put if you just put your effort into it Mm -hmm. you know they could make a great series I mean, they could, I mean, it, it, it could be like an award winning series if they wanted to because of what, what they would have available to them. Yeah. You know, they, especially with Ben, they never go all in on Ben ever. Right. They, they, they barely just scratch the surface. They, and, and they just, it's almost like they're afraid to do anything because people, you know, back from the 90s hated the clone saga, right. you know. So, you know, they want to steer away from being ever, ever having anything good happen, you know. So what I would do is 
look look at the fan base of these characters. Mm-hmm. Actually do the work. Put in the effort. You know what I'm saying? Like, actually think about it. Don't just throw them in there and just do whatever just to get the series out. You know? I mean, try. Just try. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you are a professional comic book writer. I mean, come on. That that's the thing I I said a lot when I worked in comics uh, to other writers when I'm when I had the opportunity to meet them is, and a lot of them feel this way, you know. And again, like I'm sure at some you know Zeb Wells is like, hey, I did my best, like you know, and I'm sure that's what he's saying to himself, like I don't, I, I okay, people didn't like it, but I really, here's what I was going for, and this is what we were doing, and he could probably explain it to you and come up with a good argument of why he told the story the way he did, and why him and the editing team and everyone you know pinpointed on this type thing and how they pulled stuff off, but just because they have an answer for it doesn't make it the right answer in right. my opinion. And I always said, I'm like, you have a job that many would kill to do. Like I would, I would love nothing more in the world to write a, a venom eight page backup in a random, you know, annual or something like I, and I'm not saying I have the talent to do it. I just would love the chance to try, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, and I know there are other people out there that yourself included and other fans who also would love that opportunity. So when you're writing, I feel like you have to, you don't have to focus on it or dwell on it. And some people, everyone has their own writing techniques. But for me, if I get the opportunity to do something, like I had something, I had the opportunity to write something recently. It was something I was not a fan of. I knew nothing about the world, but I was like, I have to, uh, I have to do this right by the fans, you know, like I, by their fans. And I, but I also need to inject some of my, you know, storytelling elements and some things that I like and want to bring to the table. So, I think that's a good point. You said like these guys need to just look at these characters and appreciate that they're in a position to write some of the greatest hero stories of all time. And just because their first or second or third idea sounds like it has a a style and rhythm to it doesn't mean they shouldn't analyze it further before they put it out. And, uh, and this book is a prime example of it. Like, Oh my God, I, I can't believe how, overwritten and underwritten and badly written all three that this crossover is with characters like spider-man ben venom and x-men and you brought up a good point too about the clone saga people may hate that or hated it and when it came out there's so much nostalgia for ben riley i don't know if you've watched the new spider-verse trailer um have you seen it oh yeah all right so i've watched probably a hundred reactions to it by now and every reaction in it people go Ben, it's Ben or Scarlet Spider. You know, there were so many reactions to that one moment where Ben gets like that one frame where he drops down in the rain and looks up at you. And I'm like, there were so many people that responded to I'm like, Marvel, that's the love this guy has, you know, like, and you're right. What's wrong with giving him a happy ending? Peter Parker may never be able to be happy one day. That's fine. But what's wrong with taking Ben's powers away, taking Janine's powers away and letting them just go move to like Alaska and being married? And it's like, and that's their ending, you know, it's like, that's it that we wrote the final Ben Riley story. He's out there happy somewhere. <laughs> like yeah. imagine that, like that would, I think that would blow people's minds. They'd be like, no, they're going to bring him back in a year and kill him. You know, um, where would you like to see Ben Riley go from here in this story? Cause uh, obviously, and, and we're going to get into all of them. I want to hear what you think, where you want Venom to go, because I know you have some opinions about the Venom run. And I want to hear where do you, where do you want Ben to go from here? Well, I would like for him to get his memories back at some point or, at least, get, or at least get some of them back. Sure. Um, you know, and like I said before, I, don't, I honestly, I don't care whether he's a villain or he's a hero, as long as he's written good, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And just use him well and, you know, don't make him, you know, always, he's always the one that takes the fall. Right. Always. It, it never fails. He either loses or he dies, right? That, every time. So that's what I would like. At least have him have some memories. Maybe even become just maybe just be an anti-hero at least. You know, to where maybe yeah, he still hates Peter, but he still wants to do good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's there's so much to being that he deserves a really good story you know i honestly yeah. believe he, he he does he he deserves a good story a good mini series maybe even uh later down on down the line after they really flesh out chasm 
and you know they actually try maybe even a good ongoing sure you know? i mean he could have his own villains you know sure. or um, i mean you know it's just uh, him as chasm i think is a a new grand opportunity to do something that hasn't been seen before you know what i'm saying agreed because you, you have a spider-man who's has a supernatural element to him you yeah. know he's he's read like the dark hold or whatever and he's read other spell books it's like yeah you could do something really neat with ben you're right yeah i mean something something really special could happen there and i you know it's almost like you know like i was saying about how people talk about the clone saga it's almost like some of the writers are too afraid to give ben the win like right. like he's they think like oh you know he's not that popular not that many people like him they, they are so wrong yes like they he, are he has a huge <laughs> huge fan base in the you comic know. book world he does and and after spider-verse comes out i'm sure he will to the masses too, that's oh yeah that movie yeah. oh yeah so that's that's something i would love to see you know let let him win every once in a while he never gets a win I mean, you know, let 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 the Ben Riley fans feel good for Ben. You know, I mean, come on. We I had talked about this once with James Robinson, who's an amazing uh, writer, and, and he did a lot of stuff at DC, and um, he did a, a thing with Roy Harper, who is a Green Arrow sidekick, and um, and he said, you know, there people are like, well, why why did you do that to Roy Harper? You 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 set off a bomb in Star City. It took Roy Harper's arm. So he became an amputee and it killed his daughter. Um, why would you do that? And I said, well, we felt like this character we wanted to tell new stories with and we couldn't take them certain ways unless we did something extreme. And he goes, so I, he, like James Robinson's like, I went to Iraq to do like to meet soldiers and stuff. And I, I signed comic books for them and gave them free comics to kind of help them pass the time. And he goes, and when I met a lot of them on my way back, I was flying back with some, they, most of them were coming home because they had lost a limb. And he's like, I wanted to do that to a hero in the DC universe. Uh, Cause I said, that would be great representation for these brave men and women that fight for our country or fight for the American, uh, you know, country. Cause he's not from America. <laughs> so he said, um, he said, I wanted that represented, but they won't let me blow Green Arrow's arm off. You know, he's like a staple character. So this is something that I could only do to a sidekick or someone like him. So I was trying to apply that here to Ben and then go, OK, well, maybe this was a story that they wanted to tell with a spider character, but they can't do it to Miles or Gwen or Peter because they're too well loved now. So they looked at who else they had and they said, oh, we could do it to Ben. But I feel like Ben is also a character they couldn't do this to, like you said. <laughs> like this was this was not like make him chasm, sure, but to take his memories and to do this story where he was just a flat out villain for all because he couldn't remember. And like I said, on a personal level, I hated that because I woke up in a hospital with no memories 13 years ago and I didn't want to just go kill the planet because of it. You know, like there's still something in you that is you. And Ben there's still something in Ben that's Ben. So that was very frustrating to watch on a personal level for me was see him degrade the way he did in this story for no reason other than we need him to be the bad guy. And I hope they, I hope they take away what you said and what we just said here. I hope they take that away. It's like, Hey, don't just shit on a character or make them evil because you don't know what else to do with them. Just, I'd rather you sideline Ben and not tell any stories with them than tell a bad story with him. Yeah. Would you agree to that? I, I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Uh, to that point, I would at least like to see maybe him have like little cameos here and there, you know, sure. maybe him helping out or, or, or just, just something just to let his fans know. Yeah. He's still around, you know, we, we can give him a little something to do every now and then I, I could be good with that. You know, I, I've always wanted to like bring back the slingers. I've talked about that before. And I know my friend Jeffrey Thorne wrote them recently and, uh, Dude, get do a Slingers miniseries and put Chasm in there for an issue, you know, because those oh, are yeah. other 90s characters that he can interact with. Uh, you know, have Spider Man 2099 come back in time and interact with Ben as Chasm instead of Peter for once, right. you know? Yeah, like, that'd be great. It, yeah, you could do a bunch of stuff. Yeah, throw pepper him throughout the Marvel Universe. That would be great. Throw him on the New Warriors with Janine as All Hallows Eve and make them new members of the New Warriors. Whatever you want to do, just go have fun with them instead of uh, making him this dark, like, I don't remember 
I can't go on with my life unless I remember like, no dude, now go create new memories. You know, you got Janine, like you have Janine with you. Like, exactly. Go make new memories. Have them learn that lesson. I think that would be where I'd like to see Ben go from here. Um, and, and on that note, where would you like to see them take Spidey and Venom moving forward from here? Spidey? Yeah. Um, I would like for them to actually put him in some good story arcs for once. I mean, he <laughs> for, 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 for a while now, he's been in crap storylines. I mean, just over and over. The fans will be like, oh my God, we're finally going to get rid of this writer. And there's a new writer coming in. Oh, they're going to do great. They're going to do awesome. And then all of a sudden, no, it's just more of the same shit. And yep. he just, he just keeps on going and going and going. And, and then therefore when he goes into a, like a big crossover series, it, whatever, however he's being written, just follows him through it. And it sucks, you know? And I mean, again, I mean, it's Spider-Man. He is the most popular superhero in the world. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. how hard would it be to, to write a good series for Spider-Man? His I last mean, movie alone almost made Avengers level money. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> come on. It is Spider-Man. Enough said. You know? <laughs> there you go. Do you ever, yeah. um, I remember, like, because you're, you're right. I mean, I'm in the minority. I kind of liked enough of Nick Spencer's run to, like, overall enjoy it. But I know it was not loved by a, a lot of people. Um, and I respect that, obviously. I, I know I'm in the minority there. But there was a time where Spider-Man books in the early nineties were so bad when they did chapter one with the John Byrne stuff. And then he relaunched the two books um, after the gathering of five Norman Osborn story there. Were, and then that's when they had killed and uh, and weighing and stuff for venom. It was Spidey books were so awful at that point. My favorite thing is they brought Paul Jenkins in to take over to write. And he just did one issue. And he's just like in the issue was just Peter Parker complaining. Ah, this happened. This had Mary Jane's missing. Everything sucks. And he's at the gravestone of Uncle Ben. He's like, what do I do? And uh, and there's obviously no answer because it's a gravestone. And he's like, okay. And then he turns around to leave and a, a like a dump truck or something drives by and splashes muddy water all over Peter, you know? Yeah. So after he sat there and complained about his life for 20 pages, he then just gets douched with like dirty sewer water. And he just oh, looks man. up, he looks back at Ben's grave and just starts laughing. He's like, yeah, you're right. It's not going to get any better. And that right there, like, after that, Paul Jenkins is like, okay, now I can just go tell fun Spider-Man stories again. And it's like, yes, that's all it takes. You it, it really you just get the right writer in one issue. They can just accept what happened and move on. And yep. I feel like I feel like no one does that anymore. Everyone's like, no, put him back in a sandbox so that it's easy for me to start new stories with him. It's like, no, jump in the middle and say, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> you know, let's figure this out. Let's Indiana Jones this shit and make it up as we go, you know. Yeah. Um, cause that's real life. That's how real life is. And Peter Parker is the most real life dude in comic books to all of us. Oh you yeah. Know? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Next to Eddie. Cause Eddie's also pretty relatable in that regard too. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't care where they take the X-Men because they suck. <laughs> so I don't like any <laughs> X-Men books. Uh, I, I want X-Men to go back to like once the new nineties cartoon revamp comes out, I hope that changes how they write X-Men books. Cause this current stuff is garbage to me. Yeah. So I don't even want to talk about that. Um, but what about Venom? Venom's like a time traveling Kang the Conqueror friend now. Uh, <laughs> what do you what do you think about all this? And how does Spider Man twenty ninety nine tie into it? Because you got a time traveling Venom. How is Spidey twenty ninety nine not involved? Well, that is probably um, them just not even paying attention, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I know the um, answer. <laughs> you know, um, I have to say this: Al Ewing is a great writer. Mm -hmm. He did excellent with with the Immortal Hulk. Agreed. So I was really looking forward to him writing Venom. Mm -hmm. um, also, Ram V. Ram V. If you also listen good. to this, if you listen to this, Ram V, you're you're awesome, dude. Okay, you're awesome. But I have to say, with the with the Venom run, it's not been so good. Now, Ram V is on Carnage, and he is absolutely killing it on Carnage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ram V. I know you're being held back, brother. I know you're being held back. So if any way you can get get out of that and, and be able to do your own thing, you could absolutely kill that Venom series. So I you know, I would love to just have Ram V only 
on that title. If he was the only one writing that book, it'd be it'd be out of this world, literally. Well, it's it's a shame because Ron V is now no longer on Carnage. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. The last issue, uh, issue ten, I think, was his last issue. So oh. issue issue eleven is the guy who's writing um, Red Goblin, which I thought was a a, a good first issue. Um, but apparently that writer is taking over Carnage also. So, um, so yeah, Ron V's no longer on Venom or Carnage, sadly. But yeah, I want him back. Please come back because uh, I, oh, I just started yeah. reading the Carnage stuff, and me and Eddie's Mullet are going to do an episode on that at some point. Um, but uh, I've been, I dug it. I dug the Ron V stuff, and I want to see. Uh, I would like to see him come back to Symbiote at some point. Yeah, I, I, I like him. He, he's, he does a really great job. Like he. He puts in the effort, but like like with Venom, mm -hmm. I think I think he was being being nerfed pretty badly uh, with Venom. Yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, you've seen what he done with Carnage. You can imagine what he could do with Venom if he if if they just let him do him, right? You know? I yeah, mean, it'd be great. And and this it's funny we talked about that earlier. Like, okay, the stuff that happened to Venom and Donny Cates, like Donny Cates didn't put Eddie back in a sandbox. He literally left Eddie chained at the end of that run. And I commend Donny Cates for that. I, even if I don't like every decision or step he took, I give him mad props for just going, hey, Venom's a god now. <laughs> and uh, and his son is the new Venom on Earth. And that's just how it's going to be, you know, for whatever writer takes over afterwards. And I commend him for that. That's that's ballsy and that's a surprising because normally they don't let writers do that. Um, so I'm glad he was able to do that and turn Venom into like a, a triple A level book. Like that book was selling like crazy for Marvel oh, yeah. uh, that entire time. Um, so I could see Marvel kind of in a panic of like, okay, well he's off the book now. What do we do? You know, like we, we need to get someone on here who's good. Cause I think if we just get like Al Ewing's run on in, Immortal Hulk didn't sell well uh, consistently, but it's well loved by the people who read it. So they did a good job by picking him. I don't think they did a great job by picking Brian Hitch as an artist, in my personal opinion. Um, but that artist, we have a new artist uh, that's going to be taken over in the next issue. So we won't have Brian Hitch anymore. Um, so hopefully that could help on some of the visuals problems that I have with the book. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I've got some bad news for you. Oh, hit me. Um, okay. So, yeah, we are getting a new artist, but uh, apparently Brian Hitch is coming back on issue 21. Um Oh, what? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, wow. and that's 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 for real. That's you know, I mean that that's actually happening. The uh, the cover art's already out there. Um, Eddie is going to have a new symbiote. Um, he's going to be based off of the uh, the War Star symbiote in the issues. Oh, uh, all right, with the Kang with, thing. Yeah, with Kang. Uh -huh. um, the red the red symbiote that you see. Yes. in those issues that that's what it's based off of um so his symbiote is going to be like a it's a really dark reddish black um and he doesn't have teeth or anything like that so if you remember if you remember those issues that's kind of like what he's going to look like i can't but, wait for that book to end <laughs> but, but again i'm sorry to to deliver <laughs> this but Brian Hitch is coming back on issue 21. Uh, well, it's fine. I, I appreciate your consideration though, towards my feelings. I, uh, I, I, I mean, the thing is I'm not buying the book monthly. Um, I just, when the trades go on sale, they're usually like eight 99 on comiXology. So um, I'm a big proponent of that, by the way, some people are like, dude, if you don't like it, why are you buying it? Why don't you just pirate it as someone who's makes content and had made comics and stuff. I would never want my stuff pirated unless it was by someone who lives in a country where they just don't have access to it. I understand that happens. And so I think that's there for people who can't go to a store or they don't have comiXology in their country. So I'm not against that. But like for me, I have eight bucks, you know, sometimes I can spend it on a, on a ch cheap graphic novel. And so I, so I'm still going to support with my money. Um, but it does suck because sometimes as the Venom vlog, you know, I wanted to just after Donny Cates not talk about current Venom anymore and uh and unfortunately i just keep getting pulled back in <laughs> like it's and unfortunately none of it's been interesting like uh or good i should say some of it's been interesting but it hasn't been good and that it bums me out so where i hope they take venom is i hope they end this stupid run at issue like 30 or something and just wrap up everything in a clean bow and just get rid of it and uh and just find anyone else <laughs> to write a new venom book and whether they start over with issue one or just keep going with issue 31 i don't care 
I just I want this stuff to be over with now. Same with Spider Man. I want I want Zeb Wells to, you know, um, respectfully leave the book and let someone else take over um, after issue thirty or whatever it takes for him to wrap up his story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's sucks about Brian Hitch coming back. I know he's going to go do that ultimate mini series, so that's fine. He'll be away for a while. And eh, uh, well, that, so is is he doing? Is he actually doing the art for for the yeah. ultimate? Yeah, but it's only four issues. It's only four issues. So, um, well, um, I do have to, something to say about that. Um, it's, yeah, it could be a little bit of a spoiler. I've talked with some people. Okay. Um, spoilers so, for anyone listening, if, in case you don't want the ultimate invasion spoilers, so, but I don't, I don't care. Hit me. The ultimate invasion by Hickman, Johnson Hickman. Yep. Um, the main villain is going to be the maker. Uh, good. And, and I love all Venom Ven fans know who the maker is. If you oh, yeah. read Donny Cates. Yep. Um, so the, the maker gets back to hit the ultimate universe, the, mm -hmm. you know, the 1610 universe mm -hmm. and how he gets back is he's wearing the ultimate venom symbiote. If yes. you remember, yep. he's still in possession of the ultimate venom symbiote. Awesome. So people need to think about that. You know, think about your ultimate Spider-Man's number 33. Yeah. For sure, you know, yeah. Key issues you know, there. You know, might want to think about that. Yeah, get your so copy just, of your video game from the GameCube ready. <laughs> so I'm just throwing that out there. You know, a lot of Venom fans may not have, you know, thought, oh, that's not for me. I don't want anything to do with that. Well, there's going to be a symbiote in there. Yeah, uh, and that that actually I had I did know about too, about, um, well, not about that specifically, but just that there would be a symbiote in the book. So that's really cool um, because... I'm going to buy that series. I, I Again, Brian Hitch drawing it. I'm like, eh, but at least this one doesn't star. Like my big issue with him is somehow, sometimes how he draws younger people. I don't think he's very good at the, like um, the side, like he makes Dylan and Eddie the same size, you know, like yeah. he's uh, he's not very good at like that kind of stuff. And, we, and that's just me being ultra nitpicky. Um, it's just, he is in some images and not in others. So it makes him inconsistent. And that's the only time I really get critical on artists. Cause they certainly all artists can do what I cannot do. So the only way I feel comfortable criticizing an artist is if they do something on one page and they can't do it on the next page, <laughs> you know, uh, that, yeah. that's the only time I feel good about like going like, okay, I can comment on that because that's me talking about their talent on one page and lacking on another page, you know? Yeah. Um, and I know comics, you know, you got to pump them out every month and stuff. It's not easy, but you know, do what Ryan Stegman did draw five issues, you know, take it like a week or two to, you know, ice your hands or whatever and then and then uh, let another artist take over for four issues and then you come back a few issues later like to yeah. me that's that's the life of an artist um, on a monthly book um yeah. but yeah so man oh man dark web what a shit show and uh <laughs> and i'm sorry yeah everyone who worked on this i know you worked you probably worked really hard i know i know i have no doubt you worked really hard on this book but that doesn't you know I'm sure Paul Anderson and all those people worked really hard on Resident Evil Afterlife. Doesn't make it a good movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, any final thoughts then? I got to hear any final thoughts, maybe something we didn't cover or just any last things you want to say about this run um, and, uh, you know, before we, we wrap up the show. I do appreciate uh, where they uh, um, they have Eddie becoming bedlam you actually see how he finally becomes bedlam. sure right i appreciate that mm -hmm. i also appreciate how we see how the uh um the child of bedlam is born pretty much sure uh from the hand of bedlam right um you know i appreciate that very very much uh you know because we found out way earlier in the thor issue there was going to be a child of bedlam Right. Like, how the hell is that happening? <laughs> you know, so, but I, I, I appreciate that at least, you know, trying to further the story in that sense, you know, but um, I really hope that they get uh, better writers on Venom, uh, better writers on Spider Man. I hope they do, they, they really try to do something with Ben Riley. Uh, we have Kane Parker back now mm -hmm. as the Scarlet Spider. Please, somebody do something with him. Please. <laughs> He deserves it, um, you know, and we missed him very, very much, uh, you know, so I just I'm looking forward to, you know, better stories, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just be hopeful. 
Hell yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. And I'm glad, I'm glad you told me Kane is back and I'm literally going to go and try to find that issue after work, probably tomorrow. I might even go right after work tomorrow. Um, so that's cool. So yes, Spider-Man number seven for you Kane Parker fans out there like me. Um, and like our friend here. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and thanks for saying something positive in there, man. I actually was surprised you, you gave a couple good positives and I know we did throughout the episode a little bit, but I asked for your final thoughts and you were like, you know what? I liked this. I like the bedlam thing. I like the, but it, what you said also reminds me, this feels like a, a, a crossover where they're like, Hey, look, it doesn't matter if it was good or not, because we got the first appearance of all hollows Eve in it. The first rec wrap, you know, the first uh, hand, you know, being cut off, that'll become the offspring of bedlam. It feels like one of those things where they can always go back to it and say, Hey, but there's a lot of key issues in that run. So you better buy it. And that feels oh, like yeah. that, that feels so business and soulless and generic. And I hate it. Um, so, uh, so it makes me, that's a negative for me on this, <laughs> another negative for me on this series. Um, yeah. But to everyone who worked on it, we had editors, Albert uh, Benazak, Devin Lewis, uh, Jordan White. We had assistant editors, Caden McGahey, Tom Groneman, and Lauren Amaro. Obviously, Zeb Wells, Adam Kubert, Jerry Duggan, Rod Reyes, Sabir Prezada, Francisco Mort Mortarino, uh, Jeff McKay, or Jed McKay, I'm sorry, it autocorrected. Jed McKay, Vincenzo Caratu, Ed McGinnis, Al Ewing, Brian Hitch, Christopher Cantwell, Lan Medina, all the amazing colorists, uh, um, everyone who's worked on the book, who did lettering, whatever you did. I'm sure you worked hard. These were just uh, me and Randy's honest opinions about that hard work. Um, trying not to sound like some fans out there who are just like, you're ruining my life and my childhood. And, you know, I think we came at it with clear heads. And, and I can't thank you enough, man, for making time out to record an hour and a half episode about dark web with me, even when I was like, I want to be done with this, but this was <laughs> such a, this was such a blast. And I, I promise it won't be three years before we, we meet again on this channel for sure. Well, that, that would be awesome, man. I, I love doing this, you know, especially being able to go back and forth with, uh, a Venom fan, a Ben Riley oh, yeah. fan, you know, so it, 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 it'd be awesome one day if we were, if you and I and uh, Eddie would be able to do a little podcast together at some point. You know what? I'll, as, as things start coming out in the summer, cause we got a summer of symbiotes ahead of us. Um, if there's something we all kind of gravitate towards uh, that we're interested in, whether it's some, a, an event in summer symbiotes, like, you know, the carnage rains event, We'll find something, um, but that would be really fun to do the three because we had me, Eddie, and Leith know on an episode once, and that was a blast. So I'll pass it along to Eddie, and we'll see what we can't come up with. Okay. Sounds All good right. to me, man. Awesome, sure. brother. Um, is there anything you want to say, too, last words uh, about anything before we head out? Um, I heard you uh, say uh, Devin Lewis. Yes. Uh, I want to give a shout, shout out to Devin Lewis. He's a friend. Okay. Uh, really good guy. Um you know, so I know a lot of people give him shit and everything, but you know, he's, he's a Venom fan at heart, man. And so, I don't doubt that, you know, I never had the pleasure of talking to him. I actually would have really loved to have him and interview him on the show. Um, because I think sometimes I've worked in comics, I've edited comics like Witchblade and other stuff, but I never, um, I never, not on the level that he probably works, you know, Marvel, it's a much bigger, you know, scale. And, uh, I've always wanted to, to pick his brain, but I honestly think I probably was so vicious on some of my reviews that I don't, he might just not like me. And I would respect that if that were the case, but I never had a personal issue with him because I never met him, but I hear from you. You've told me numerous times and other people that he's an awesome dude to talk to. And I'm like, man, I, I really, I miss the opportunities not being on Twitter sometimes uh, because he seems like a really cool guy. So let him know he has a fan here as far as like a, him on a personal level. And my criticism is just my, my, you know, just my point of view and it's, it's nothing personal, yeah. um, but that's cool. I'm glad you shouted him out. Cause I know on this channel, I've, I've said a few critical things about him, um, but I never met any harm. So hopefully, he oh, yeah. Into, yeah. hopefully he never took it as harm. If he ever, I don't even know if he's seen an episode. So, um, but that's cool. Yeah. Shout out to Devin, man. And uh, we're, and I know he worked on some of these books he did some of the tie-in issues. He didn't do the main book, but one criticism I gave him in the past was that something that happened in one book wouldn't match up with something in another. Um, one of the things we talked about before was, uh, was Miles Morales getting a carnage symbiote in absolute carnage. And then just that story never paying off in the final absolute yeah. carnage issue. Well, apparently it will pay off in um, carnage reigns. You will actually see a conclusion to that and a wrap up to the, the arc with him and Scorpion uh, miles and Scorpion. 
So um, you will actually see that in Carnage Rain. So that someone told me that recently, and I was like, okay, I'm excited now that that story is going to finally that thread's going to be paid off. But in this one, Devin and the team actually did a good job of Miss Marvel disappeared in this book and appeared in this book. And besides that one gold goblin thing I mentioned earlier, it was on point. So uh, I think they did their jobs as far as continuity goes, book to book. It was just the story was suffering, okay. and I, and I kind of lean more on that on the writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but awesome. All right, cool, man. Well, again, Randy, brother, thank you for your time, man. And like I said, we'll come up with something for Summer Symbiotes. Try to get me, you, and Eddie on an episode. That sounds great, man. Awesome, brother. Will you take care and everyone watching? Thank you so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace. See ya. Oh, yeah.